So if you've ever seen one of my videos on simplifying radical expressions, you probably think it's pretty straightforward, which it is. However, students make mistakes time and time again when simplifying radicals. And I don't want you to make the same mistakes. So the next time you have a test or a quiz, or you're just working on a problem with radicals, I want you to avoid the mistakes that I'm gonna lay out here. Let's go ahead and take a look and see which mistakes that I have found to be the most common with students inside of my class. The first mistake is actually pretty well justified because it comes from a point where I think a lot of students, you know, kind of recognize that when I have the square root of 25 times x squared, one of the first things that we practice doing is breaking this apart using multiplication. So that is gonna be a rule of radicals that we can break up the product of a radical as the square root of 25 times the square root of x squared. Right? So therefore we can focus on the numbers and the variable expression separately. So the square root of 25 is just gonna be a five and the square root of x squared is going to be a five x. That's very good. However, what happens is when we start separating them by addition or subtraction, students use the same idea and you cannot do that. We cannot distribute the square root to the x squared and the negative 25. It looks like we want to because they're both square, but we cannot do that. It does not equal a x minus five. I know a lot of students want to do that, but that is not correct. The only thing that you could possibly do here is you could maybe simplify um, by factoring the x minus 25, x squared minus 25 into an x minus five times an x plus five using the difference of two squares. Now, another example that students again will use is if we had a trinomial, for instance, like an x squared plus four x plus four. Right, And so the students see the x squared, they see the four, which is a square number. And again, they want to distribute this, which again is not the correct answer. So they might get like an x plus, I don't know, a two square root of x plus two. Please do not do this. The only thing you can do is again, try to factor what is under your radicand. Now in this example, this actually works out pretty good because this is what we call a perfect square trinomial. So it can be factored down into a binomial squared, which is x plus two quantity squared. Now. I can take the square root of x plus two squared, which is just gonna leave me with a x plus two. That's good. Now, the next mistake that I see students making is spending too much time simplifying radicals. Now, again, if you're just beginning, that's okay. But for the rest of us, we don't wanna rely on these methods that take far too long to simplify a radical. Let me show you what I mean. If we had the square root of 48, a lot of students first learn how to simplify radicals by using prime factorization. They'll just simply break out the 48 by dividing by two. So you have a two times a 24. And they'll just keep on dividing by two until they get to the prime factorization of this number, which in this case is going to be, let's say we could even do four times three, and then we have a two times two, right? And then they rewrite the prime factorization, which is two times two times two times two times three. And then what we do is we pull out the pairs, right? Because when you're taking the square root, you wanna find numbers that are multiplied by themselves. So then you have a two times a two times the square root of three, because you can pull these twos out. Right? And then two times two is a four times the square root of three. Now again, it's not a mistake. It just took me a very long time. And if you're working with problems that we have to simplify multiple radicals, we don't wanna be spending this amount of time simplifying a radical like this. Now, another mistake that students will make, which is very similar to this, is they'll just divide by a positive by a square number that divides into 48. They don't try to find the largest square number. So in this example, they say, well, 48 is going to be divisible by four and four is a square number. So they can say, well, I'll do four, and then that's gonna be 12, right? And then they can now break this up. The square root of four is going to be two, and then times the square root of 12. Now they'll either leave it like this, and then they won't get their final correct answer because it's not fully simplified, or they'll realize that now they have to simplify the square root of 12, which would be a four times three, which again is going to be a two times two times the square root of three, which again gives us our answer as the four to the square root of three. So the way to get around this is to find the largest square number that evenly divides into your radicand. So in this example, that largest square number is going to be a 16. So I can rewrite this as a 16 times three. The square root of 16 is four times the square root of three. And there you go. The last mistake that I see students make time and time again is when we have a negative radicand. Now for square roots, hopefully most students recognize that you cannot take the square root of a negative. Like the square root of 16, right? We know we can rewrite this as a four squared, right? And therefore that's gonna equal a four. However, you cannot take the square root of 16. There is no number that is exactly the same, right? You can't rewrite this as a negative four squared because a negative four, right? Because negative four times negative four is a positive 16. Now we're gonna come back to that in just a second. 
So a lot of times when stu students remember this, that they transfer this to cubes or any other odd index. But again, we got to be careful because if I say, what is the cube root of eight, right? We know that we can rewrite this as the cube root of two cubed, right? Which is equal to two. Now it's important. The difference between cubing something and squaring something is really important here. Because if I multiplied something by itself three times, it can actually be a negative. So if I have the cube root of negative eight, I can rewrite this as the cube root of a negative two cubed. Now this works unlike squaring, right? Because now my answer is a negative two, because watch, a negative two times a negative two times a negative two is indeed a negative eight, right? But negative four times negative four is not negative 16. So it works whenever your index is odd. So whenever you have an odd index, you can take the cube root or the index of a negative radicand. However, if your index is even like two or four, you cannot take the square root of a negative. Now, it's very important for us to recognize that and to understand because when you have a variable expression under the radical and you don't know what the value of X is, how do we make the difference between a positive four and a negative four? Because as we know, one can work and one cannot work. However, that only works for the even root. That does not work for when we have a odd index. So what we simply want to do is just understand whenever I have a square root and I'm taking like a X squared. Now we know that only the positive version of X is going to work of whatever that number is, right? If it was four, not negative four. So when I take the square root of X squared and I get a answer that is raised to the odd power, I just want to make sure that I am clear that this is only the positive result. So that is when we use the absolute value. We do not need to use the absolute value. For instance, if I had a like a X squared squared, that gives me a X squared as the answer. Since my answer is already being squared, we know that if it was negative, that would always make it positive. So therefore, there's no absolute needed. It is only when we have an even index and our answer is raised to the odd power. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Those are some of the common mistakes that I see students make. If you want more examples of me simplifying radicals, go ahead and check the playlist below, or you can check the next video I have for you on radicals right here.